I'm Dick Clay. I'm the president and the CEO of the Filson Historical Society. Thank you for joining us this evening for the Gertrude Polk Brown lecture series featuring author Mary Beth Norton and her latest book, 1774, The Long Year of Revolution. This lecture series was initiated in 1993 as a memorial to the life of Gertrude Polk Brown, and it's made possible by the continuous generous support of her family. Dace Brown Stubbs, her daughter, G. Garvin Brown IV, a grandson, Laura Lee Brown, a daughter, and then her grandchildren, Garvin Dieters, Laura Lee Gastus, and Polk Dieters. The series has brought internationally recognized historians to Louisville, more than, and get this, 37,500 citizens have learned more about the significant stories of our region, our nation, and our world because of the Gertrude Polk Brown lecture series. The Filson is extraordinarily grateful for this generosity. We're also grateful to all of you, our supporters. Tonight, I am honored to introduce Mary Beth Norton, as our Gertrude Polk Brown speaker. Mary Beth Norton is the author of five books and she is the co-editor of several others. Her textbook, A People and a Nation, a survey of US history written with five other authors has been published in 10 editions and has sold more than 500,000 copies. Dr. Norton is the Mary Donlan Alger Professor Emerita of American History at Cornell University. Now it is my distinct pleasure uh, to turn the program over to Dr. Mary Beth Norton. And trust me, all of us are in for a major treat. Thanks very much, Dick. I hope everyone can see and hear me. I um, want to talk about my new book, 1774, The Long Year of Revolution. I wrote this book to describe political discourse among Americans in the key year of 1774. And why was that? Why do I say that 1774 was the key year? Well, there are two reasons. First is that the importance of 1774 events have, has commonly been overlooked, despite the fact that this year immediately preceded the outbreak of fighting in April of 1775. Now, I the title of the book is The Long Year of Revolution, which sometimes confuses people. It's because I'm talking about more than strictly a, uh, a year of 12 months. I'm talking about uh, 16 months, the period between the late fall of 1773 and the middle of April of 1775. Historians tend to use this term long to describe something like a century as in the long 18th century or the long 17th century, meaning the months immediately preceding or even the years immediately preceding um, a century. But I decided to use it for a year because this is a period in which um, great changes occurred, but people have been overlooking it amazingly enough. You would not think that the year 1774, the long year, would be overlooked by historians. But it has been because most histories of this period, or rather almost all histories other than my own, have been written from the standpoint of the revolutionaries. So if you look at the long year of 1774 from the standpoint of the revolutionaries, what you get is a view that makes it seem as though everything after 1765 and the Stamp Act crisis and the Townsend duties crisis and so forth seems to follow sort of automatically. But that's not true. Um, it doesn't follow automatically at all. And I hope to show you all of that this evening. I want to explain first 
why I thought the year was so important. And it's because my own scholarly work began with the loyalists. And my dissertation, my first book was on the loyalist exiles of the American Revolution. And I thought that based on that work, uh, long ago, I decided that 1774 was a really crucial year in the making of loyalists. And therefore, it's also a crucial year in the making of revolutionaries. And if we think about it a little bit, this long, what I call the long year of 1774, starting in late 1773, um, these are the events that are crucial in the making of the revolution. Just think about it a little bit. In 1773, Americans, almost to a person, were loyal to King George III and to the empire. Not even leading revolutionaries like John and Samuel Adams would have differed with a statement that they were loyal to the empire. They gloried in their British identity. But by late 1774 and early 1775, months before the fighting started uh, at Lexington and Concord, that had changed. And how do I know that? It's in part because of letters that the royal colonial governors uniformly wrote home to Britain to say that they could not get people to obey them. Um, that the people of America regarded the, con the constitutional, um, sorry, the Continental Congress's um, resolutions as their laws. And so it was best not even to try to force them to obey um, because if you tried to force them to obey, the governor said, that would show our impotence. It would show that they're not obeying us, that they won't obey us. And so it's better not even to try. Those were the uniform contents of letters that were sent from America to England by royal governors starting in about December of 1774 and going through the first months of 1775. And it's not just the royal governors, it's Americans in general wrote to Britain in that winter expressing to their friends in Britain and their contacts in Britain, their belief that there was going to be war in the spring. That basically, quote unquote, I could say it was all over. That um, there was very little hope for reconciliation unless the British moved very quickly um, to, to um, take such, such conciliatory steps. Now, I said in the very beginning that what I'm talking about in this book or what the book is about is political discourse. So what I read for the book was newspapers and pamphlets. I actually read every political pamphlet published in North America between October of 1773 and uh, April of 1775. Um, I read a lot of correspondence, every bit of correspondence I could find. What I wanted to do for the book was to recapture the events of 1774 as they happened. So my book is organized chronologically. It's also organized geographically. Um, previously, when the events of 1774 have been discussed, they have those events that are talked about are almost exclusively events that occurred in Boston and Massachusetts. And I wanted to get past Boston and Massachusetts. I wanted to include information about Philadelphia and New York and Charleston and Savannah and basically all the colonies up and down the Eastern Sea Coast. And I wanted to get past um, basically an emphasis strictly on um, political institutions. I wanted to know what all the colonies thought about it as best I could find out. And in fact, Georgia turned out to be especially interesting for that colony along with uh, North Carolina, along with New York City had many dissenters and indeed North Carolina, I mean, sorry, I keep misspoke, misspeaking here. Georgia um, did not send any representatives to the First Continental Congress. There were so many dissenters in Georgia who opposed the idea of sending a delegation. Now, although the book has plenty of action, including descriptions of large groups of men throwing tea overboard from ships in various cities, it's not just in Boston, I might add, and um, uh, also uh, groups late in 1774 attacking forts in New England to take control of cannon, muskets, muskets and ammunition that are stored there. I have to tell you all that the book 1774 is mostly about talk. 
It's mostly about Americans discussing with each other in print and in letters, what should be done as the crisis deepened and the year progressed. I wanted to give voice to all the participants in the multifaceted dialogues of that year. I wanted to show moderate and conservative positions as well as radical ones. The moderate and conservative positions, I'm sure you all realize, usually get overlooked in a discussion of this period that focuses on the revolutionaries and what they are doing. Um, the moderates and conservatives get, um, get discussed only briefly and only sort of mysteriously because you don't know where they're coming from uh, when they talk. Uh, but I wanted to know also all of this, regardless of where people ended up, whether they ended up as loyalists or whether they ended up as revolutionaries, whether they ended up somewhere in the middle. And you can't always tell uh, where they're going to end up from the positions that they take in 1774. My ideal is for my readers to forget that they know what happened at the end of the long year of 1774. Um, to forget until they get to the very end of my book that they know how the story came out and to give immediacy and contingency to the discussions that Americans had in 1774. Just as today, we don't know how the political story of the United States is gonna come out. I want people um, to read 1774, my book, without knowing how, without thinking about that they know how 1774 actually turned out. Now, there were many disagreements in the course of the year 1774, and I don't have time this evening to discuss the whole book. So what I want to do is just focus on four examples that are simply not discussed in most books on the coming of the revolution. And I'll bet that none of you, or very few of you, unless you've already read the book, have any idea about these arguments that beset the colonies in 1774. Now, first, what was the best way to oppose the tea that was being sent to North America by the East India Company? This was a matter of considerable disagreement among Americans. But first, I have to explain why Americans wanted to oppose in the, the, the uh, tea coming from the East India Company in the first place. I might add here and start by saying that Americans were known at the time as prodigious, that's a word from the period, prodigious tea drinkers. Everybody, including Native Americans, including enslaved people when they could get their hands on it, drank tea. This was not a period of coffee drinking, this was a period of tea drinking. And so why did Americans want to oppose the tea coming from the East India Company? Well, the legend today, of course, is that they were opposing higher taxes. This is not true. They were actually opposing a lower tax. This seems very counterintuitive, but it is actually the fact. What the British Parliament had done in the now infamous Tea Act of 1773 was to lower the tax that Americans would pay on East India Company tea imported into the colonies. Now you can ask you can answer ask two questions about that. One, why is, why would the Parliament do that? Why would they lower the tax? And secondly, why would the Americans oppose a lower tax? Isn't that a really good thing to have a lower tax? Well, the par and the answer to both to both of those questions relate to the the uh, tea trade in North America in 1773 and 1774. In fact, throughout the entire 18th century, a lot of the tea that Americans were buying was actually smuggled. It was not legal tea imported by the monopoly of the East India Company, um, that which had a legal monopoly from the early 18th century on all um, imports into the colonies from, um, from China, from the East, as it was called at the time. Um, but what they were doing was buying uh, tea uh, that was smuggled, and it, well, most of it was coming from the Dutch East India Company. A lot of it was being smuggled through the Dutch West Indies, through the colonies in the Dutch West Indies, or from other Caribbean colonies, which uh, were easy for American vessels to, um, to sail to and to pick up tea that had been smuggled from, from the Dutch. So this is why wherever the tea came from, the smuggled tea came from in the colonies, it was called Dutch tea. 
So you'll see in the documents of the period comments about English tea and Dutch tea. Doesn't mean the tea actually came from the Netherlands. It means it was smuggled through the Dutch East India Company. Now, the problem with the, from the East India Company's perspective and the problem from the perspective of the British Parliament was that um, the East India, uh, that the Dutch tea was much cheaper than the illegal tea smuggled, the legal tea imported through the English um, West India, through the, uh, through the East India Company, because it, of course, didn't have to pay a tax. It was smuggled. So the idea was to lower the tax on the tea being, the legal tea being sold in the colonies to try to make it more competitive in price with the Dutch tea, with the smuggled tea. So um, that's the British Parliament's motive. And I might add that many members of Parliament, it will not surprise you to learn, were shareholders in the East India Company. So the financial success of the East India Company meant something to all of them, uh, more than personally as well as nationally. So there's a reason why the British would lower the tax on tea. But why would the Americans then oppose the tax on tea, oppose a lower tax? And they opposed it because they of its symbolism. Because by 1773, they had concluded and this includes people who were future loyalists, I might add, they had concluded that they did not believe that parliament should tax them. I'm sure everyone has heard the phrase, no taxation without representation. What the Americans meant by that was not that they wanted representation in parliament, which was a body that was taxing them, but rather that the body that was taxing them, that is parliament, should not have the right to do that, that they should only be taxed by their own uh, legislatures, by the legislatures for which they or their neighbors voted. And so that was the, the uh, so the attacks on East India Company tea were for to uh, oppose the tea for symbolic reasons, not for financial reasons. Now there were different, I said there was a big argument about how to oppose the East India Company tea. There were different uh, theories or pro, uh, practices, proposals for how to oppose the East India Company tea. One early proposal was to force the tea consignees to resign. Now, the tea consignees were the merchants who were designated by parliament to receive the tea coming through the East India Company. And so that argument went like this. If the consignees, that is the favored merchants in North America who are receiving the tea, resign their uh, commissions so they they're, therefore they cannot receive the tea, therefore they cannot sell it, therefore we don't need to worry about it. So that's one argument, force the consignees to resign. And indeed, in all the cities that were designated to receive East India Company tea, that's Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and Charleston, there were attacks on the tea consignees to force them to resign. And in three of the four cities, they did resign. Not in Boston, but in Charleston, New York, and Philadelphia, they did resign. So that was one argument. Another was to say, well, forget about the consignees, forget about that, that issue. Let's just everybody agree not to buy the tea. We'll just have a consumer boycott. And so indeed, one of the things that the Americans did was to start passing around sheets of paper in which people signed their names and said, we will, we, we promise faithfully not to buy East India Company tea. So that was another, another uh, solution to the problem or potential solution to the problem. And I'll have more to say about that in a minute. <coughs> Excuse me. Another um, argument or another uh, solution that was proposed was don't let the tea land. Um, let the tea come into the harbor. Um, uh, there are harbors, but don't let it off the ship and uh, prevent it from landing. Now, obviously the most destructive way that was done was in Boston, but it was also done in um, Philadelphia and New York by actually not letting the tea enter the harbor, the tea ships enter the harbor in the first place. In both cases, in Philadelphia and New York City, the tea ships were intercepted before they reached um, the harbor and they were forced to turn around. There was also another option that was pursued. Um, it was not proposed initially, but it was then pursued 
uh, in practice, and that was confiscating the tea, having the authorities confiscate the tea. And the authorities could be different. In Charleston, that's what happened. Um, customs officers in Charleston confiscated the tea for non-payment of duty, because the customs law at the time said that um, the duty on any imported cargo had to be paid within 20 days after the ship entered the harbor. And so if uh, what happened in Charleston was people couldn't decide, literally couldn't decide what to do. Um, and so they simply let uh, the time run out. They let that deadline pass. And so on the 21st day, the um, customs officers in Charleston simply confiscated the tea and stored it in the exchange building on uh, Charleston Harbor. And some of you may have been to Charleston and seen that building. It's still there today. You can visit it as I have. Um, uh, later on, there were also local people who confiscated tea. Um, when there were committee, local committees established to um, uh, oppose the tea, uh, they would sometimes take over tea shipments rather than having it destroyed or having it not, um, not allowed to land or having it um, set off somewhere else. Um, and this happened with tea that was left on Cape Cod because a little known fact is there were actually four ships headed for Boston, three arrived, one wrecked on Cape Cod. And um, a, a part of the tea, a good part of the tea was set up to Boston uh, to the British headquarters after the shipwreck, but a small quantity of it remained on Cape Cod um, and was fought over by local people and was ultimately confiscated by uh, local committee local committee authorities uh, who finally let it be sold. Um, so that there was some tea from the East India Company sold, a little known fact, um, sold in 1774 that had come in from, um, that had come from the shipwreck on Cape Cod. Now I said earlier that the consumer, I would say a little bit more about consumer boycotts. Um, that certainly had the most staying power in a lot of ways. Um, and indeed, you see lots of publications in the newspapers urging the boycotting of tea, sometimes for political reasons, but other times for health reasons. Uh, there were doctors who argued that tea was bad for your health, and so you shouldn't drink it. Uh, and uh, th especially women should not drink it. Uh, there were other people who argued um, that um, uh, we should that Americans should instead drink local tea. You know, there were recipes for making tea out of sassafras and other kinds of indigenous um, indigenous plants. Um, and it's very hard, however, to assess the impact of all this propaganda uh, because we know that many people continue to drink tea even if they did it in secret. And one of the nice um, uh, quotations that I particularly enjoy from 1774 is a letter from John Adams that reveals that while he was riding the circuit in Maine in the late summer of 1774, he was very tired. He'd been on, on horseback for most of the day, riding for 30 miles or more, and he came to Falmouth, Maine, what's now Portland, and he asked his innkeeper, could he have a cup of tea that had been honestly smuggled? That's his phrase. And the innkeeper said, no, um, the town has forbidden anyone in town to serve tea, so I will give you coffee. So um, John Adams drank coffee that night and the rest, the rest of the time he was staying in town and he wrote his wife, Abigail, this report. That's how we know about it. And he told her that he was now drinking coffee every day and he was bearing it very well. That's his phrase. Now, another issue, of course, was that it wasn't just the tea that was sent in 1773. People had a lot of tea already in their houses. The stores had lots of tea on hand um, and more tea kept arriving, uh, not directly being sent by the East India Company. Uh, so there were lots of people who said, destroy it and so destroy whatever we had on hand. So there were public burnings. For example, the students of Princeton University held a public burning nominally of all the tea they were saving in their rooms, but did they? We don't know. Um, uh, and some people said, well, we'll just keep it. We won't drink it. Um, but did they really do that? We have, refer we have records of uh, women who at long after the war said, well, yes, we signed the agreements not to buy or drink tea, but we 
sat in the basement uh, with our teapots every other afternoon or something like that and had a good time. So, um, so some people said, well, why don't we just drink smuggled tea? But then other people said, we can't know the origins of the tea we're drinking. So we had to stop drinking any of it. And so this was a constant argument literally throughout 1774. Do you drink tea? Do you boycott tea? What tea do you, is it okay to drink smuggled tea? Is it not okay to drink smuggled tea and so forth? So that's an ongoing argument that you just never hear about in other books, but which I do talk about in 1774. Now, secondly, another, there's another major dispute that you never hear about, which is disputes over paying for the tea that was destroyed in Boston in December, 1773. These debates started throughout the colonies immediately after the news spread of the destruction of the tea. That's what it was called at the time. Um, the name Tea Party did not appear until the early 19th century. Actually, it was 1826 um, that it was first used. Um, and it was used first used um, in, a, in, a, in a newspaper in New York City. And this was found by a colleague of mine at Cornell, Larry Glickman, who uh, works on consumer boycotts. Now, um, but there were different responses in Boston itself and elsewhere, both before and after the colonies learned of the British response to the destruction of the tea. Now that response was the Boston Port Act, which closed the port of Boston from the first, from the first of June, 1774 until the tea was paid for. Now Bostonians did not learn about this until the middle of May, 1774. So they had hardly any time to react to the uh, Boston Port Act. But many people lamented the action of the Bostonians um, both before and after they learned about the Boston Port Act. For example, George Washington, once, once he learned of the Boston Port Act, he wrote rather famously in a letter, uh, the cause of Boston is now the cause of all America. And anyone who's familiar with the period is familiar with that quotation. What we're not familiar with is the fact that he added a parenthetical uh, statement after that in, in parentheses, indeed, not that we, I approve the destruction of the tea. Um, Benjamin Franklin did not approve the destruction of the tea. He was in London and he spent months writing back to Boston, telling his friends in Boston that they should not, um, that they should in fact go ahead and pay for the tea, that they should offer to pay for the tea, that it would not be giving in on their principles to, to do that, that it really had not been a good idea to destroy this private property, that is the tea of the East India Company. Um, some people, uh, in the colonies maintained a discreet silence, even when they supported Boston after the Boston Port Act was adopted and they expressed their solidarity with Boston, they never said, oh, we think you were right to destroy the tea in the first place. In fact, some of them said, no, we support you, even though we thought you were wrong in <laughs> destroying the tea in the first place. And one of the most obvious places this appeared is in Virginia. There were county meetings in Virginia throughout the summer of 1774. Uh, there were 28 county meetings in all. 23 county meetings did not express an opinion on whether Boston had been correct in destroying the tea. One county said Boston was right to destroy the tea. Another county said Boston was not right to destroy the tea. They, had to, they did a bad thing. And then three counties said, we don't know whether Boston was right or not, but the other 23 counties just didn't mention it at all. They just adopted resolutions in support of Boston without saying whether they thought Bostonians should have destroyed the tea. Many people thought that the East India Company should be confiscated, even possibly including the shipping costs that they had lost um, by the fact that they had shipped this tea that they couldn't sell. Um, but then the ish question was, who should compensate the East India Company? And so they began to argue about that. Some people said, well, you have to identify the perpetrators and make them pay for the tea. Well, it was impossible to identify the perpetrators. Remember, they were disguised. And they were disguised well enough that it wasn't for a number of decades that they finally began to identify themselves. And people finally began to figure out who exactly they were. Um, 
should they be compensated officially by the town of Boston? Should Boston tax itself to pay for the tea? But then some people said, well, wait a minute, most of Boston wasn't involved in destroying the tea. That was just a few local um, thugs or whatever. And so Boston officially should not have to do it. Other people said, well, wait a minute, why don't we just have Boston unofficially compensate the British? Um, just take contributions from people, voluntary contributions. And indeed, some wealthy Bostonians began to step forward and say to the royal governor of Massachusetts, yes, we will help to pay for the tea. Um, some people said, wait a minute, why not all of Massachusetts helping to pay for the tea? Um, or maybe all colonies should chip in to pay for the tea or individuals throughout the colonies would give um, contributions to pay for the tea. These, all these things came up over the course of the year 1774. John Dickinson, whose name you may know, was, became a famous revolutionary and was an important person in the uh, resistance movement before 1774, argued officially in, uh, as a member of a um, uh, Pennsylvania, um, legislative body in the summer of 1774 that Americans should use payment for the tea as a bargaining ship with the ministry to win repeal of other acts that the Americans didn't like. You know, in other words, say to the let's say to the British, we'll pay for the tea. We'll all chip in and pay for the tea if you will uh, repeal these laws that we don't like. Now, this question was not decided until October of 1774, when the Continental Congress had a debate on the matter. And um, the Continental Congress, it seems to have argued about it for about a day. And then they decided, no, uh, this will not happen. The Americans will not pay for the tea under any circumstances as a bargaining chip or whatever. And um, uh, and in fact, we don't, alas, we don't have any good record of the debate on this matter. There's just one delegate's very brief note. So it's hard to know exactly what was said. So the third debate I wanted to talk about tonight is um, the debate over calling a Continental Congress in the first place. Um, this was rather more easily resolved. Boston didn't actually want a Continental Congress. Boston wanted the colonies to join in an immediate cessation of all commerce with Britain and the British uh, West Indies as a pressure, as economic pressure to fight the Boston Port Act. Um, and, but other colonies said, no, wait a minute, we have to talk about this first. We can't join a consumer boycott without thinking about it, without all of us getting together. So other colonies, especially New York, Connecticut, and Pennsylvania called for a Continental Congress to discuss matters. And the only colony that robustly supported Boston initially was Maryland. And so therefore the Continental Congress was actually the conservative alternative to the radical position which called for an immediate boycott of British goods. And the Continental Congress then, as we know, met in Philadelphia in early September. And when it met, the pamphlets written before it saw it as a conciliatory body, at least potentially. And indeed, um, quite remarkably, um, pamphlets by future loyalists like Jonathan Boucher and Thomas Bradbury Chandler that are published before the meeting of the First Continental Congress basically tell Americans to, um, to have faith in the Congress, to believe that the Congress will be conciliatory. So the fact that the Congress was not in the end conciliatory, did not meet those expectations, is um, something that um, was not expected. And But that's another story, and I'm not going to talk about that um, unless you want me to discuss it. Um, but I want to give one further example, and this is an example of um, and heated argument in an individual colony that ended up having uh, large implications for all the colonies. And this is an argument that happened in New York City. And it began when General Thomas Gage, who was in charge in Boston, tried to recruit laborers from New York City to go to Boston. And also when he tried to buy supplies from merchants in New York City. This is after the Bostonians quit working for and supplying food to the, to the troops that had, that had been occupying Boston since May of 1774. Um, 
Now, so Gage, as I said, turned to New Yorkers, and this caused a major fight in New York as a group of New York radicals began visiting merchants to try to pressure them not to comply with Gage's requests. This led to competing public meetings. It meant to competing broadsides. Um, New Yorkers loved to um, publish or print their positions. There are many broadsides that date from this period as, Amer as, um, as uh, New Yorkers are arguing in print uh, in handbills that would be posted up on, on uh, walls and so forth uh, in the streets about what, about what they're examining their positions. The, the divisions were very complex in New York at this time because even John Holt, who was the printer of the most radical of the New York papers that was allied with the Sons of Liberty in the city, published a broadside that argued that actually we should supply Gage, that is New York should supply Gage, because not supplying him could cause even more problems by leading the British to raid uh, outside of Boston to um, get goods by confiscating them from people's farms and houses. So in the middle of these heated arguments, three Anglican clergymen decided to write pamphlets and newspaper essays from what we would now call a loyalist perspective. And then supporters of resistance responded to them, including Alexander Hamilton, who was then a college student at King's College. This was his first publication. Um, he thought he was replying to a publication by the college president, Miles Cooper, but he really wasn't. The pamphlet was actually by the New Jersey clergyman, Thomas Bradbury Chandler, who I already mentioned a minute ago. Um, and I might add that if, as a professor, when I read Hamilton's um, response to um, Bradbury's um, pamphlet, it read to me like a freshman production because he didn't know how to end it. He just kept talking. Um, he has no conclusion. Um, very typical of, a, of an undergraduate. Sorry if there are undergraduates on this call, uh, but it's true. Um, the pamphlet war continued well into 1775, and it became known throughout, the, throughout what became the nation and is well known today uh, because it included pamphlets by Samuel Seabury and other newspaper essays by a whole bunch of other people and, and pamphlets by members of the Continental Congress and so forth. But it was initially instigated by a local debate, and that local debate was over whether New York City should be supplying um, laborers and um, and assistance to the or supplies to um, New, to Boston. So by early 1775, by the time that pamphlet war was raging, circumstances had really spiraled out of British control. I want to repeat what I said at the beginning. By late 1774 and early 1775 the governor's letters to the ministry expressed their helplessness and their inability to control the residents of their colonies. This is underscored by similar comments from ordinary Americans writing to their friends in Britain. Now I wanna close this evening um, with one of the epigrams that I use in the book, which shows exactly that. This is an anonymous essay from November of 1774 in the, in the newspaper, the Pennsylvania Packet. I have no idea who wrote this, but I know it wasn't written by Thomas Paine because we know when he arrived in Philadelphia and he did not, he was not yet in Philadelphia at the time this appeared. I can tell you when I read this for the first time, my jaw dropped, but here, let me read the words of this anonymous essay. Quote, I almost wish to live to hear the triumphs of the Jubilee in the year, seven, in the year 1884 to see the medals, pictures, fragments of writings, etc., that shall be displayed to revive the memory of the proceedings of the Congress of the year 1774. Let me read that first part of that again. I almost wish to live to hear the triumphs of the Jubilee in the year 1874. Now that certainly implied independence. And when I read it, it carried echoes of the centennial celebration of 1876. It just was two years too early. And that's certainly how people at the time read it. It was considered very controversial at, when it was published and the author did not write a promised follow-up or if he did, he never revealed his authorship of this particular essay. But in November of 1774, after the, after the adjournment of the First Continental Congress, he had in fact predicted not just independence, 
but a celebration of independence. And to me, this really cemented my initial idea that the year 1774 was absolutely crucial in developing ideas of American independence. Thanks very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Mary Beth, that was just great. Thank you. And you do have some questions and here we go. This is from, um, get it up here. Yeah, George S. Maley. Um, as I was reading your fine book, I recalled the words of Mao Zedong. <laughs> anyone, quote, anyone who wants to overturn a regime needs first to create public opinion and carry out ideological work, end quote. Mm -hmm. In the context of the American Revolution, is there any way to determine how much public opinion and ideology were serendipitous uh, or ad hoc uh, or how much was planned and coordinated? Um, I don't see much evidence of planning and coordination, um, not at least from the beginning of the year. Maybe later in the year, after the meeting of the First Continental Congress, I think, yes, then there is planning and coordination. It comes from the Continental Congress. Let's remember that the men who went to the Continental Congress, for the most part, didn't know each other before. This was the first time they ever met. And they and and they it created um, cross colony contacts that uh, were completely novel. It created alliances that were completely novel. And after the Continental Congress, I do think, yes, there is some coordination and there is some planning. But I think a lot of it is ad hoc. And you can see that developing, I think, over the course of the year. I gather you've read the book. So you know that the book is really about the ad hoc things that happened during the year and um, uh, how people respond to them individually, but that but eventually, especially toward the end of the summer and the beginning of the fall, you begin to see um, a, a coalescence of opinion, I would say. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that the British handle it very badly. <laughs> All right, next question. This is um, from Richard Working. Professor Norton, a year ago, Professor Gordon Wood of Brown University reviewed 1774 in the Wall Street Journal. Right. He began and ended his essay Right. with his own references to the New York Times well-known <laughs> 1619 project. What are your thoughts about that 1619 project in terms of its claiming a connection with the War of Independence? Right. Um, my thoughts are that I'm very much in favor of the 1619 project, but not in favor of what is argued with respect to the War of Independence. Um, the, the timing is all wrong. I mean, I Gordon Wood, who I've known for a long time, uh, he was a graduate student at Harvard when I, well, he was actually a young professor at Harvard when I was a graduate student at Harvard, so I've known him for a very long time. Um, and um, I disagree with him about the 1619 Project fundamentally, but I do agree with him that, in fact, my book shows that the argument of the 1619 Project, that somehow um, slaveholders in Virginia or anywhere joined the revolution because they feared the abolition of slavery in the British Empire. That's wrong for two reasons. One is they were already on board with the revolution before there was any sense of the British being anti-slavery. And the British were not yet anti-slavery enough. They didn't really become anti-slavery until after this period. So, uh, or there was not a, uh, an adequate anti-slavery movement in Great Britain until after this period. So um, I, you know, I, I disagree with him with respect to the 1619 project overall. I think it is absolutely crucial to talk in general about the, appearance, about the importance of um, African-Americans and slavery in American history especially in the early period when it's been so often overlooked. But um, I do agree that it is irrelevant to the coming of the revolution. It is not irrelevant, I might add, once the war starts. Um, uh, Robert Parkinson, in his wonderful book, The Common Cause, shows how much the colonists used uh, the African-Americans or the potential threat of slave revolts and the potential um, attacks by native peoples on the, on the frontiers as a means of bringing white people together. 
So, but that's after the war starts. You don't see it before the war starts. Okay. Thank you. And then here's one from uh, Garrett McCorkle. Peter S. Carmichael's book, The Last Generation, argues that young Virginia men relied heavily on their ancestral connections mm -hmm. to the revolutionary generation to justify their choice to secede, a reactionary move. Mm -hmm. Most secondary literature generally points to Southern states remaining loyal during the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. Why do you believe many conservative um, and reactionary movements in the past and today rely on connections to Americans' revolution? I think everybody relies on connections to Americans' revolution. It's not just conservative movements today. It's also radical movements today. I mean, the revolution is there for anybody to draw on. I mean, you certainly find it when the way people draw on the language of Jefferson's um, Declaration of Independence. So I would not see the uh, argument that it's, it's more common for conservatives to draw on it. Um, I'm not familiar with the book you mentioned, um, so I can't really comment on that, uh, Carmichael's book, but um, I do think that the revolution has something in it for everyone, including, for example, the Tea Party, you know, the modern uh, modern group of conservatives who call themselves the Tea Party, or at least did call themselves the Tea Party. It's not entirely clear to me how, how much it is that still exists, but remember that that movement is all about opposing higher taxes. But in fact, that's not what the Boston Tea Party was all about. That's not what the opposition to tea was about. It's just how you interpret it. Another question. Um, what was the most unusual or most interesting source that you found while researching this book? Well, uh, yeah, that's fun. I, I have to say um, the most unusual source I found was a series of little slips of paper at the Huntington Library in Pasadena, California. And what these little slips of paper are and why they survived all these years is they are people asking permission from the local committee that controls the confiscated tea locally to have tea to drink for health reasons. And so it's there, there are little slips of paper in which someone has written, I, my doctor says uh, to give me a half a pound of tea because I'm sick and I really need this um, to re restore my health. Or my neighbor came to me and his son is really ill and he needs tea to restore his, his health. And I think these are so fun. There, there are things that you anyone would throw away, but somebody kept them and they've ended up at the Huntington Library in California. Well, it sounds a bit like um, <clears throat> medicinal bourbon here in Louisville during Prohibition. Yeah, it's, yes, exactly. But it's it's they're fun because, um, well, for one thing, they show us that the committees um, had you know had uh, supplies of tea that they doled out to people, and they show us that people didn't believe the propaganda that they were reading in the newspapers that said tea was bad for their health because people wanted to drink it for health reasons, or they thought they wanted to drink it for health reasons. And um, anyway, that's it was it was a very, most unusual source. There's about eight or ten of them in this collection at the Huntington Library. Wow. Here's one from um, um, Dennis Jennings, Professor Norton. Thank you for your research and your detailed and clear explanation for the Boston Tea Party. Uh, I look forward to reading your book. So that's not really a question. It's just a. <laughs> Okay. But, uh, and then here is another one from Stephen Brown. Uh, were Presbyterian ministers um, especially guilty, between quotes, of fanning the flames of revolution in 1774, as alleged by Nicholas Cresswell in his journal? Ah, well, Nicholas Cresswell's journal I use um, in the course of the book. Poor Nicholas Cresswell. For those who are not familiar with Nicholas Cresswell, he was a young British man who decided to do a tour of the colonies just as 1774 started. And he was in the middle of everything and he ended up interned um, for, oh, I think almost a couple of years um, before he could get out. Um, he was held as a spy. He was believed to be a spy. He was just a young guy trying to do a tour of the colonies. Anyway, um, 
ministers in general, other than Anglicans, that is the um, Protestant ministers, other than Anglicans, yes, were accused of being um, of whipping up the uh, the local uh, the local people, and that's certainly true of the Congregationalists in in uh, in New England, and I think it's probably true of the Presbyterians uh, in uh, Virginia and the Middle Colonies also. All right. Um... Who do you think won the pamphlet wars of late teen, of late 1774 and early 1775? Well, I actually think the loyalists won them. I mean, I don't, but winning doesn't mean they won more people. They won over more people, but I do think they won them because they offered arguments that the uh, revolutionaries or the future revolutionaries did not really rebut properly. And one of the things I do in the book is to go through very carefully the very famous debate between Massachusettsensis, the conservative person, he's actually two people in Massachusetts, and John Adams writing as Novanglis. And John Adams is usually very much celebrated writing as Novanglis for supplying these arguments in this pamphlet. But in fact, if you look very carefully, he elides or ignores many of the arguments that Massachusettsensis makes, and he does not come right out with a, uh, with a uh, flat um, way of responding to them. I mean, he basically, um, he basically um, skips <laughs> talking about difficult problems. He will not address them. Massachusettsensis is much better able to address directly specific issues than John Adams is. He, John Adams is very clever, actually, but um, he is he also um, avoids the issue too many times. Oh, here's a good one. This is from Jim Haynes. Uh, were the Dutch better than the British in marketing and capitalism? Had it uh, not been for tea, yeah. was independence inevitable? Yeah, well, um, I don't, wait a minute. what was the rest of that? You know, uh, I was responding to the first part of the question. Really, two questions. Yeah. Uh, were the Dutch better than the British in marketing and capitalism? That's the uh -huh. first question. Right. And then he says, had it not been for tea, was independence inevitable? Ah, okay. Well, let me deal with the Dutch and the and the British first. I mean, the British had um, the monopoly, the East India Company, which was supposed to monopolize this trade. So, I mean, I suppose... That's monopoly capitalism, but it's not capitalism in the sense that we think about it as sort of free, free market um, capitalism. Um, the Dutch um, are much more open. I mean, they too have the Dutch East India Company. It's supposed to be a monopoly, but they don't really care very much. They just want to make money. Uh, the Dutch are really, really good at making money in this period and indeed um, have been even better in the 17th century, which is called the great golden age of, um, of the Dutch empire. So um, I think the Dutch were better than the British. Um, the Dutch, in, in fact, the Dutch were much more willing to look the other way um, on uh, legal and illegal practices than the British were. Um, and the issue of, is there, I don't believe anything is inevitable. Let's put it that way. I don't think anything in history is inevitable. I, I would not look back and say some event is inevitable. So I would say what, regardless of whether T is involved, um, I would never argue that the, um, that the revolution became, was inevitable. What sites did you visit that were important in the book? And what insights did you gain from your visits? Well, um, the most important site that I gained, that I visited that really gave me insight was the site of the shipwreck on Cape Cod. It's where the, as I was saying in the talk, uh, the fourth ship bound for Boston wrecked on Cape Cod on its way to Boston. And um, uh, that site is now in the uh, Cape Cod National Seashore. And I was fortunate that I have a personal friend who's a retired National Park Service employee. And she enabled me to, she put me in touch with the people who run the Cape Cod National Seashore or who were running it at the time I visited. And two rangers very kindly took me over the sand in their vehicles to see this, the probable site of the shipwreck. And it taught me a lot. Um, it was quite a ways from Provincetown. The, um, 
uh, the ship had to be, um, the, the, the tea had to be offloaded um, in the middle of a huge storm that actually ended up destroying the ship. And it had to be carted, obviously probably by, by ox carts over high sand dunes to Provincetown where it was stored. Uh, it must have been a hell of a job. And um, I had a real sense of that because I was able to see um, the site of the shipwreck. It was even though I was there in the middle of the summer or in June, I guess it was in June. Uh, it would have been too hard to get there in the middle of the summer. I was there well before the thundering hordes had arrived. But even then, uh, it was very uh, enlightening to see where this wreck had occurred and to understand what was involved in getting the ship, uh, getting the tea off the ship and um, understanding the geography of the of the situation. We have three more minutes. And so here is um, a question from Marsha B. Can you talk a little about the size and distribution of British troops uh, in the colonies during this period? And actually it's from Jim Bennett. Okay, well, there's only two, there's only really two places that have British troops in this period and that's in Boston and in New York. And New York doesn't have very many because they were sent up to Boston. Um, so uh, there are troops that arrived uh, with Gage when he came from London in, 17, in May of 1774. And then there were also some troops that had been stationed in New York that were moved up to Boston. But that's the only place in 1774 that there are troops. Well, then here's one more for you because okay. we still have time. This is from Glenn Tall. Uh, how much influence did the East India Company have on British policy uh, in the American colonies? Um, a lot less than they would have liked. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, not a lot. I mean, what they, they were basically, um, they were, the, the East India Company was pretty desperate at this period. It was trying to avoid bankruptcy. They were kind of at the mercy of parliament and what parliament would do for them. So they didn't have a lot to do with the, the, uh, the policy toward the colonies. They were really only interested in um, preserving their financial well-being if they could do that. And as I said from the beginning, what they were trying to do was to improve the, um, the market for East India Company tea in the colonies. I really want to thank you, Mary Beth, for it tonight. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, your, the questions uh, from the participants were simply outstanding and your presentation was great. We really appreciate it. And uh, welcome uh, virtually to Louisville, Kentucky. And I hope that uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, you'll be able to come back when we're totally open. And that would uh, be nice. Ready that would to be nice. Would be very nice. That would be nice. Okay. Thank, thank you very you. much. I've had a very nice time. And uh, agreed. Bye. Good night, Bye. everybody.